the answer for that is, you know, quite simply twofold. One, because it was a writing challenge. I mean, it's uh, very, uh, we always assign gender to our characters because we tend to think of gender as being binary. Um, in fact, um, if you spend any time with, uh, you know, genderqueer people, you know that it kind of exists on a, on a, on a spectrum. Um, and so the more time that I've spent with, with folks who are genderqueer, the more I realize that, you know, the boxes of male and female really don't describe everything. So it was fun for me to be thinking in that mindset of if I was going to write a character where gender wasn't specified, how, how would I do it? When Chris, who is the protagonist, um, came to me, um, I, I specified in my brain, I was like, I'm not going to write a gender. I don't know what the gender of my protagonist is because I consciously decided not to ask that question. It was simply going to be Chris. And that's been really interesting for me because people bring to the character their own defaults. Like guys will almost always think that Chris is a guy. Women will frequently think that Chris is a woman. And it's been interesting in a way that is subtle because I don't beat people over the head with it. There's no point in doing that. But it's been fun to see people read the character, identify with the character, put their thoughts into the character, and then later figure out that the gender is never specified and what does that mean to them. So uh, as, a, as a writer that was a lot of fun to do. I was a film critic be, uh, professionally before I did anything else, right? I got my first, uh, my first job out of college was as a film critic for a newspaper. Um, and so for about five and a half years, um, I had to look at cinematic storytelling uh, and I had to break it down. I had to say why it worked and why it didn't work. So in, in some sort of sense, a lot of my storytelling comes from uh, cinema and comes from the, the cinematic grammar. So I think rather than has my, uh, has my uh, stuff being optioned uh, affected the way that I write, I think it's more the fact that the way that I wrote, because it was grounded in that sort of cinematic grammar anyway, made it easier uh, for me to sell it to Hollywood. So rather than coming in one direction, it kind of works in the other. For me, what it is, is there are like some people who are like, I don't, I don't trust electronic publishing or you know, self-publishing or anything else like that. And I just see it as a whole bunch of opportunities to do lots of different things, right? Um, and for example, with both The End of All Things, the upcoming book, and The Human Division, which was the most recent book in the Old Man's War series, we released them in episodes uh, before, uh, electronically before we compile it into a, a finished novel. And part of the reason to do that is to basically see what the market is, is to see what the market does. Are people interested in serialized or episodic fiction like that? And if they are, um, what does that mean for us moving forward because it might be in the future that you release stuff serialized much more than we do now. It's something that we did back in the 19th century. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Dickens did it, you know, Twain did it, you know, Dostoevsky did it. People panic anytime anything changes, particularly in publishing, because they think that everything is the way it is and it will always be and it will run that way forever. Everything changes. And the question is, how do you approach that change? Are you terrified of it? Are you scared of it? Do you embrace it? Do you see it as an opportunity? And generally speaking, I see it as an opportunity. You know, there are some things I like, there are some things I don't like, but at the end of the day, these things are gonna happen whether or not I like them. And so the question then becomes, how can I make this work in my favor? How can I make it work for my audience? And how can we get it together so that no matter what, um, I get to continue writing and they get to continue reading? So that's, that's the question for me. The one thing is that I learned that writers are contrary, you know, um, that they really do come in all shapes and sizes. They all come in, you know, different political persuasions. They come from all different perspectives. And, um, you know, you've heard the expression herding cats, right? You know, I, I now know what that expression truly means. Um, but it was, a, it was valuable for me. I mean, the thing that you, that you learn is regardless of what they write in science fiction or who they are as science fiction writers, um, that all of them are professionals, all of them are interested in their careers, all of them are generally speaking 
uh, ready and willing to help other writers with knowledge, with encouragement, with inspiration, even with ideas. And there are two ways that you can deal with it. You can either ignore it as a writer and decide that's not something you're going to participate in, or you can basically cannonball in. Um, and I'm a, I'm a cannonballer in this particular sense. It was something that, um, as a writer, I found super sustaining. To be able to go to an organization of other science fiction writers and to know that they had my back if I had you know, trouble with a publisher or trouble with an agent or an editor. Uh, to learn from them, to meet some of my idols, you know, and become peers with them. Um, so what I, what I learned is that, you know, it's not just, it wasn't just a professional organization, it really was a community of peers and, and colleagues inside a larger community of friends and fans. Um, and for someone who is a writer who spends most of their time in a room in front of a screen typing, um, knowing that that community exists is actually a very positive thing. So that's what I learned, and I, I was glad to have learned it.